the hills. Love comes to us with joy. The world is filled with beauty. Flowers appear on the earth. Bird song light brightens the day. Crops yield their produce in abundance. And the air is filled with sweetness. The simmer of God's love is with us. Let us pray. Creating God, you are the source of summer's splendor, the beauty and fragrance of delicate flowers, and sweet sound of songbirds. We, we, we come to you this morning with delight and gladness, grateful for all of your wonders. As the fields produce their harvest, may your love grow within us, that we too may produce a harvest of love, hope, and joy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
First Baptist Church of Ahoski. Yes. Why Ahoski? Why is that in the name? Because we live here. 27910. Yes, that is Ahoski. Okay. Church. First Baptist Church of Ahoski. Why church? Because we are a church. I thought that's what you say. Because we are a church. And we are. Okay, how about first? We're the First Baptist Church. Thank you. First Baptist Church. Yes, not the first Christian church in Ahoski, but the first Baptist church that um, settled here in Ahoski. All right. There's one last word. What have I missed? First Baptist. Do you know what that means? Very good, Henry. Henry said we get baptized. Yes. And it does come from the same root word. Baptist actually means immersed. If you immerse something, you put it all the way underwater. You cover it all the way underwater. We got the name Baptist because we believe that the best way for someone to be baptized into the church is to be immersed. Now, it's not the only way to be baptized, and we accept people who come from other baptism traditions, which I'm so grateful we chose to do that. But that's where our name came from. It means, to put it bluntly, we dunk people into the church. Children understand that, that word very well, dunk. Um, I like to say it's more eloquent than that. We do immerse people. But that's where we got our name. The word Baptist means immersion. And if you, some, some of you already have, some of you hopefully hope will, decide to accept Christ as your Savior and be baptized into the church, we'll do the same for you. You will be in our baptistry, which is like a big pool, so you can go all the way under the water. There are other types of churches, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, United Methodist, United Church of Christ, um, so many other churches. But we got our name by the way we baptized. I thought that might be interesting to you today because we're going to talk more about what it means to be Baptist later in the service. People of God, what is our prayer for these children? Our prayer is that they would grow up to be like Jesus, strong and brave, full of grace and truth, and that we will help them. Amen. Thank you, children. that the sermon he or she is preparing needs to be shelved in order to share with the congregation a message that speaks to current events. That is the case with my sermon today. And the current event is a Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting held June 13 and 14 in New Orleans. Now those of you who are aware that First Baptist Church of Ahoski hasn't been affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention for 30 years, 30 years, must be wondering, what does the convention's 2023 meeting have to do with us? Here's my answer. The reason our church left the Southern Baptist Convention in 1991 is because 
beginning in 1977, a strategic plan was made to overtake leadership of the convention in order to challenge long-standing traditional Baptist freedoms. At that time, the document that governed the Southern Baptist Convention, the, the, excuse me, the, guide, the document that guided Southern Baptist cooperation among churches, state, and national conventions, was the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message. By the year 2000, having fully overtaken control of the SBC, that document was revised. The new Baptist faith and message weakened those long-standing traditional Baptist freedoms. And last week, or two weeks ago, at the Southern Baptist Convention, they approved a proposed amendment which weakened those freedoms even more. Though we're not Southern Baptists and haven't been for 30 years, we still use the 1963 Baptist faith and message as our guide. And there are four tenets within that document that Baptists like us passionately hold in place. They are Bible freedom, soul freedom, church freedom, and religious freedom. We're going to review those tenets today, and the format for this review will consist of four short homilies integrated with scripture and hymns that support each freedom. I'd like to share that my sources mostly come from these persons. David Hughes, the former pastor of First Baptist Church of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Bill Leonard, the Baptist historian and retired dean of Wake Forest University. And Walter Sheridan. He is the executive director for the Center for Baptist Studies, and he wrote the book titled The Baptist Identity for Fragile Freedoms. I hope you find this informative. Mostly, I hope you find it worshipful and a good help for us Baptists trying to be the good Baptist that we are. Today's first epistle lesson comes from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it derives soul from spirit, joints from marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bible freedom, David Hughes writes, is the idea that the Bible is central to Christians. And individual believers are free to interpret the Bible under the Lordship of Christ, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and in the context of Christian community, which is the church. In the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message, the portion that describes the primacy of Scripture ends with this sentence. The criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. The criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. The 2000 Baptist Faith and Message removed that sentence. Why does that one little sentence matter? Here's an example of why it does. In the 21st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses instructs parents regarding how they are to deal with rebellious sons. It reads, If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father and mother, who does not heed them when they discipline him, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his town at the gate of that place. 
They shall say to the elders of the town, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the town shall stone him to death. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel will hear and be afraid. I hope those passages bother you. They certainly bother me, but it's in our Bible. It's Holy Scripture. What in the world do we do with it? According to the Baptist Faith and Message, 1963, we look at these verses through the lens that is our Christ. Would Jesus approve of parents stoning children? No. Of course not. The criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. This sentence matters. <clears throat> Here's another example. The amendment the SBC approved two weeks ago had to do with women in ministry. Back in the late 1970s, when the plans for the takeover of the Southern Baptist Convention was put into place, one of the primary issues that grated on the takeover architect's nerves was female ministers. Therefore, when the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 was written, the following statement was added and approved, or approved and added. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. For the past 23 years, though, many Southern Baptist churches have still been calling women to serve as pastors, associate pastors, and ministers of various kinds. An SBC pastor in Northern Virginia led a campaign to settle this issue once and for all, and he succeeded. An amendment was approved which stipulates that a cooperating Southern Baptist church affirms, appoints, or employs only men as any kind of pastor or elder as qualified by Scripture. They used scripture from 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 to support this amendment. Women should be silent in the church. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. According to the Southern Baptist Convention, I cannot do what I'm standing here doing right now. The SBC has clearly shown their interpretation of these passages, but what do we do with them? Would Jesus approve of this amendment? As I read of his many encounters with women throughout the scriptures, I believe the answer is no. I wouldn't be standing here if I believed differently. Catherine Segar on Crosswalk.com provides this helpful litany. She writes, in the New Testament, an unwed girl, Mary, accepts a divine, dangerous assignment that changes the course of human history. Anna becomes the first evangelist, prophesying that the Messiah has come. Mary lavishes her inheritance on the Messiah's feet. The women at the tomb were the first to testify to Christ's resurrection. Sometimes that's called the first sermon. The women at Pentecost prophesy and speak in other tongues. <clears throat> Priscilla instructs Apollos. Chloe leads a house church. Phoebe is a deacon and courier of the gospel. Junia is an apostle. That's in our scriptures. We hold scripture sacred. Its message is central, central to our faith and our practice. We read it, we study it, we interpret it and proclaim it. And we do so through the lens of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs>
the Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Soul freedom. The second of the four fragile freedoms of we Baptist is the idea that every person has the right to make the free choice when it comes to matters of faith. No creed, no clergy, no government official has the right to force faith on anyone. Baptists noted time and time again in Scripture that people of God were given a choice when it comes to following God. The concept of soul freedom is what led Baptists to adopt what we call believer's baptism as a foundational practice. One is baptized when one makes the personal, uncoerced choice to claim Jesus Christ as Lord and to follow His teachings. A case in point is when Joshua said to the Israelites, Choose this day whom you will serve. I hope our response is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so when asked, what is that great thing I know that delights and stirs me so? What the high reward I win? Who's the name I glory in? We answer. Jesus Christ, the crucified. Acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bible freedom. Soul freedom. The third is church freedom. David Hughes defines it this way. It is the idea that local churches are free under the lordship of Christ to determine who they will be, what they will do, and with whom they will associate. In short, 
We call this local church autonomy. Baptist churches have no bishop, no district superintendent, no hierarchical system that controls them. The individual members under the Lordship of Christ and in prayer and discussion with one another make the decisions for each local church. We, the First Baptist Church of Ahoski, have chosen to associate and partner with the national and state bodies of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. It was birthed out of that 1977 plan to change the Southern Baptist Convention. When the takeover led to the dismantling of those four fragile freedoms, a group of Baptist and Baptist churches realized they had no place at the Southern Baptist table anymore. With good conscience, they could not associate or partner with the Southern Baptist Convention. Why would you give such freedom to the people? It's kind of democratic-like, isn't it? Because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, the ability of each and every believer to access the wisdom of God and sense the guidance of the Holy Spirit through prayerful discernment. When I was talking with my older brother, Monty, about what happened in the Southern Baptist Convention, he asked such a good question. He said, Anita, those churches that are expelled from the Southern Baptist Convention, what do they lose? I had to think about it a good bit. Because of this priesthood of the believers and local church autonomy, they really don't lose anything. They're still Baptist, perhaps cooperative Baptist, other kind of Baptist. Um, they might miss the fellowship and association in some ways. But I thought it was such a great question. I even posted it on Facebook. I said, okay, Baptist friends. Monty laughed when I told him I posted this question on Facebook. But I got look, looking for different answers for that. Um, more and more, the Southern Baptist Convention has drawn lines in the sand. And they have erased or are erasing the priesthood of the believer and local church autonomy. Thanks be to God for this church, which still holds to these four Baptist freedoms and partners with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship.
All right, our gospel lesson is coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, and it's going to be verses 15 through 21. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Heridians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and asked, and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. This is the word of God for the people of God. Religious freedom, David Hughes writes, is the longing to worship Christ without any interference from Caesar. Early in our history, Baptists determined that our lordship is to Christ alone and not to kings or queens and other elected leaders who demanded that their loyalty to the, loyalty to the government take precedence over loyalty to Christ. Many Baptists were imprisoned and executed for that stance. So when the opportunity came to help establish a new nation, the United States of America, our Baptist ancestors came to this country determined to help establish a government that practiced separation of church and state. Today, the Baptist Joint Committee, whose offices are in our nation's capital, keeps vigilant watch for any effort to weaken that separation. Our former pastor, Daniel Glaze, served as the chair of the board for the Baptist Joint Committee during his tenure here as pastor. The Baptist Joint Committee has been especially busy for the last two decades or so as Christian nationalism has risen up and gained fervor. Christian nationalists believe that our country was established as a Christian nation. Now, why would those who settled this great land choose to establish, choose to establish a national Christian nation when one of the primary reasons they chose to come to America was to be able to practice their faith freely without interference of the government? Why would God want to be loved and worshipped and followed only because the government said we had to? David Hughes puts it this way. The fact that neither politicians in Washington or Raleigh or preachers in Nashville, the headquarters of the SBC, or Atlanta, have any power over what we believe as American citizens is something we ought never, ever take for granted. Baptists have made many mistakes over 400 years, but one thing we've done right is fight for religious freedom. There they are. Those four fragile freedoms that this Baptist church holds as our sacred tenets for living our faith in God through Jesus Christ. I realize this may not be as exciting information to you as it is to me. I live in that Baptist world. I check lots of uh, media sources to find out what's going on. I don't imagine too many of you do. But after walking through the summary of our four fragile freedoms that we cooperative Baptists hold dear, are you wondering, does it really matter? Does it matter that our nation has federal laws that help us live with one another in relative peace? 
Does it matter that our nation has federal driving laws that help keep us between the lines, safely secured with seat belts, and our children safely secured in car seats? Yes, in the secular world, we need rules, regulations, and guidelines to help us live well with one another. And it matters. It matters that we Baptists have long-standing traditional freedoms that help us practice our faith in ways that honor God, follows the teaching of Christ, is led by the Holy Spirit, with respect to those who believe differently than us. I imagine you are part of this church more because of the fellowship than perhaps anything else. And it's a beautiful thing. But I hope today, whether you're a lifelong Baptist, or you're a Methodist who came here after your church closed, or whatever your background is regarding your denominational faith, I hope today you've been able to um, put some feet to the ground, to plant yourself in a good place, and stand on these four tenets which are so valued in the kind of Baptist, Southern Baptists were, and the kind of Baptists that cooperative Baptists are now. And so are we. For our closing hymn today, we are going to sing In Christ Alone. I hope you've heard that theme throughout these four Baptist freedoms. Christ is our lens, our guideline. So today, I invite you to stand and sing with fervor that our faith is in Christ alone. And if you would like to join this church today, I'll be waiting to receive you down front.
Let us pray. Lord, we are the receivers. Receivers of love, receivers of grace, receivers of Jesus. We are the givers, following God's call, following our hearts, following Jesus. We give these offerings, O oh Lord, for the heart of your humble kingdom, with humble thanks for mercies received. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
up a good bit. Even put the offering at the end of the service. But I hope it kept you perhaps not captivated, but at least interested in learning more about what it means to be a Baptist. But in truth, what's more important is that we all be Christian. So this week, and the way you live, and the way you speak, and the way you think, and the things that you do, and the things that you refrain from doing, may they all be pleasing to the Christ that we love. For the love of God, our Father, and with the help, thanks be to God, of the Holy Spirit. Amen.